All right, guys, if you were looking at the book, you'd think we were going slowly. We're only on page 19 of the PowerPoint of chapter two. Well, we've got a couple excuses for that. One is that we had a couple of snow days and we started a week off, right, where we didn't go to class Monday. On the other hand, I also tend to kind of wander and meander, and I do that on purpose. Like I've said before, I like for you to see it in action before you read about it in the book or on the PowerPoint, so that the second time you look at it, it makes perfect sense. But let's see how much we can get through today. So this slide is a, I believe I told you, an absolute fib as far as Python is concerned, but it's absolutely true for a lot of other languages. Which is where if you have a whole number and you divide it by a whole number, most languages will calculate that as a whole number as a result. So if you say three divided by two, <coughs> we would hope it'd come out to 1.5, but since these are both whole numbers, those languages will just say it's one, which will mess up your calculations, right? Or if you have, you know, three over four, we'd like for it to say not 75, but it'll round it down to zero. Totally not what we want. That's only if these are whole numbers. If you add a decimal point to one of them in those languages, it's all good. Now we're back to seeing 0 0.75 there. If we put a decimal point on that one, now we're back to seeing it to 1.5. It's just called integer division. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about it. When you go on to another language, you will. So just kind of tuck that away in your brain as something we don't have to worry about. What is this rounding down technically called? Truncation. Truncation. We do the same thing with the slash slash operator. If we say, three slash slash two, then it truncates, does floor division, rounds down. So in that case, three slash slash two is one. And then the modulus tells you what the <coughs> remainder of that would be. Two goes into three one time with a remainder of one, just like if we had this, right? Two goes into three one time with a remainder of one, right? That's what modulus means. Modularization, subunit of programming. We did a module, we've done a couple modules at least. Pretty sure that we did one when we were doing that turtle program demonstration. It's a name with a block of code so that whenever you wanna draw that particular shape, you just call that one module and it draws it. Some languages are called subroutines, and some they're called procedures, and some they're called functions, and some they're called methods. In Python, they're really called functions. But I'm going to use the term module a lot just because the book uses it so heavily. So modularization is breaking down a large program into modules. Got a fancy term here, functional decomposition. Like if I was going to break my program down, I might try to break it down into several pieces. One is, you know get input from user, and then another module might be perform calculations, and another module might be show output to user, right, or display results, that kind of thing. I'm just breaking it down into three big chunks. Like if you were planning a party, you wouldn't want to write down every single step you'd need to do. You just want to put, you know, bake a cake, order pizza. You wouldn't want to put all the steps of ordering the pizza where you have to call the phone or log online, right, with your app and, and type it in. You just want a big step, a big overview. That's when you're starting to do your modularization. What is abstraction? Abstraction is paying attention to important properties while ignoring non-essential details. Also known as selective ignorance. I love that term, I'm selectively ignorant. Okay, so suppose I have some kind of drawing program such as Turtle, and it's got a function on it called dot circle. And if I call dot circle, it draws a circle. I don't need to know the details of how it does it. I don't need to know what kind of math is involved in calculating all the dots of a circle. Thank goodness, right? I don't want to know how to do all that. That's called abstraction, high level, right? I get to look at the code. I see that I'm calling dot circle. I'm happy that it's drawing a circle. 
but I don't need to know the non-essential details. <coughs> now, whoever wrote it, they're not non-essential to them, right? But when you're creating your modules, if you've done a well-written module, if somebody else comes in and starts using your code, and they want to call your module, they shouldn't have to know all the non-essential details. They should just be able to call your module and it magically works for them. They need to know just enough in order to get by. <coughs> That's the idea of abstraction. So newer high-level programming languages. I think I showed you the uh, Apollo Guidance computer source code. I don't even know why you're asking me that. <coughs> No, no, no. I just wanted a picture. All right. I do not want to have to write a program in that kind of language. Yeah, I learned a little bit of a simpler when I was in college. And I've never written an assembler program since. If you don't have to do this, you won't. But this is a very low-level programming language. Remember when I talked about the opcodes? And I didn't talk about what the numbers behind it was, like when I was going to do read for memory address this and store memory address that. There was an opcode called read, but it was really just a number. The chip only wanted a number. And then there were some numbers, and then there were some more numbers after that. Well, those are called operands. Operands are the piece of data that an operator or an opcode needs. So this is the opcode, that's the operand. Well, if this was stored purely on a disk, when we went and looked at it, this would all be just be numbers. I absolutely would not want to program all just in numbers, but honestly, I wouldn't want to do it like this. But this is a step up, right? At least it's got words, right? Sort of words or abbreviations to make it slightly easier. I have no idea what all these words mean, but you know, at least it's slightly, you know, better. This is called a low-level language meaning you're down on the ground playing with the individual pieces of sand when you're trying to build a sand castle. Low-level languages, nah, we don't want low-level languages. We want high-level languages. High-level languages, remember when I had those like four, opera, uh, four operands in order to read two pieces of data, do an add and write it back out? We'd rather just be able to perform algebraic notation, right? I'd rather do this, A equals A plus one. That's readable. Or I'd rather be able to say, you know, print result. Now, that's not going to work in our particular language. But you get the idea, right? English language words. High level language of, you know, have a very specific syntax you have to follow. But at least the words are in a language we can understand. Hopefully. I think I've said before, like, you know, if you're Iranian or, you know, Persian or Chinese or whatever you grow up, you have to learn English in order to learn programming. It's kind of a weird thought. And before the, uh, the Russians started, you know, integrating with the rest of the world, their programming languages were written in Russian. So, you know, if I opened up one of those, I would not be able to understand it. But once I learned the Russian language, I'd be halfway there because it's a high-level language. It's written with an English-like syntax, right? You know, A equals input. At least I have the word input. I kind of understand what that means. And if I'm doing pseudocode, it might say input A, right? Even better. Pseudocode is just pretty much the English language with kind of a loose syntax to follow. So if I was going to write a pseudo program to ask for a number and ask for a number and then multiply the two and then print the results, it might say input A. I'm sorry, that font's so small. Let's fix that. There we go. And then it might say input B. And then it might say set E. Some books would even draw that silly arrow. I'm not going to. Is equal to A times B. And then output C. Right, that's pseudocode. It's just a very loose, you know, <coughs> description of it. I could give that to a C++ programmer, they'd write it in one way. It'd look something like this, but it'd have a whole bunch more involved. Because they'd have to declare these variables, and I'm forgetting the semicolons, and I'm not saying what, you know, what this data is that they're seeing. And then I'd have to declare my variables above that, right? So anyways, and put semicolons everywhere and tell the user what they needed to type in the A, B. Right, this is all the details. 
all the details for solving that problem. And I left several details off because if the user doesn't know what to type in here, then they're up a creek. It'll just sit there with a blank screen. They won't know what to type. So we need to put a couple of more things into it. If we were doing, you know, a real program, C out, you know, enter A, <coughs> something like that. Same thing before we let them type in C out, enter B. Now, if we're looking at this, what's going on here? In C++, the language for displaying stuff on the screen is C out, which means console output, which just means display on a terminal window. It does the exact same thing as our print statement does, except it's got these weird symbols. C++ is kind of a weird language. And then it's got this CIN, which stands for console input, which is the same thing as keyboard input. Looking pretty cryptic, actually, right? But what you've looked at it for, you know, more than once or twice, it starts making sense. So this is a C++ representation of that. Now to get this to work, we'd have to put it in a main method. We would have to put some includes up at the top. I'm not trying to frighten you away from taking C++. I'm just showing that an actual program is an expression of pseudocode. This is the idea. Kind of like if I was George Lucas and I came up with an idea. I'm going to make a movie about these, you know, space knights who run around fighting with, with laser swords and then they fly around in spaceships and blow up the big space station, right? That's my overall, you know, idea for a movie. And it's funny listening to him talk. He actually calls them laser swords, even though in the movie they're called lightsabers, right? But anyways, so, you know, he comes up with an idea for it, but then he fleshes that out to a great big script. This is the big, great big script that would make, you know, this program. We wouldn't want to write it like that. Just to refresh ourselves, why don't we write this as a little bit of a Python program, but we've already done this before, so you might not want to bother. But I am going to start off the lecture this way, but then I'm going to comment it out because I don't want to have to answer these questions every single time. Lecture G, it looks like. Still in chapter two. <coughs> So this was our pseudocode. I'm just going to start off my pseudocode with little comments because they're not real programming language. It would cause a syntax, syntax error if I did it. All right, so that's my pseudocode for the program. Now, once you've written pseudocode, one thing you can do is just to use those like chapter headings for your program. I could go and I could put programming code right between these lines, right? And then this serves as a comment describing what's coming next. So if I leave myself some space here, well, input A. Well, just like the C++ programmer wanted to tell the user what they needed to type in, we're just as good as C++ programmers, so we're going to type in print, parentheses, quote, input, or what is the value of a question mark, end quote, in parentheses. However, the way that I'm setting it up to go here, it's going to require three steps. And I know I mentioned this before. You could do these three steps all on one line, and we'd be a lot happier doing that so that when we get to input B, I'm going to do it the shorter way. And then A equals input, parentheses in parentheses, Maybe I might want to put a little, you know, greater than sign telling them where to type. So inside the input, I'm going to put quote, greater than, end quote. One thing you'll see me do, don't type this, but when I'm starting to type something, I'll do that. I'll fill in the, you know, the borders, and then I'll do that, you know, and then I'll start filling in the inside, and that way I won't forget to put my close quote and my parentheses. But I don't always do that when I'm sitting up here typing for y'all. But if I'm not reading it aloud, you may see me do that. Okay, so anyways, we've done our print, we've done our input, and now we need to convert that to a float so we can do math. A equals float, parentheses A. Very common mistake is people will just put A equals float. Or they'll just say float, parentheses A. Right, they'll leave off half of it. If you just say A equals float, it may not be a syntax error, but later on it's going to break. Because it will not actually have converted A. We didn't tell it what A was. If we just do float A, that passes A to that float function, you know, with its level of abstraction, and it goes and it turns it into a number, but it doesn't store the results anywhere. It's like me telling you to go to McDonald's and order me some food, but then I never take it at the end, right? 
So it has to have both. It has to have that. It has to have that. Okay. So the act of displaying a message and asking for the input and letting them type it in is known as a prompt. This is prompting for A. Okay, now I'm going to do this input B in the shorter syntax. And it's not that much shorter, but at least it's only one line of code, right? And so if I can remember this one line of code, I might be happier typing it. B equals float parentheses input parentheses now I'm going to close my two parentheses before I forget about it. Close, close. Because you have to have the same number of closed parentheses as open. And then inside those parentheses, I'm going to put my message. What is the value of B question mark space space greater than end quote. And there, that does it in one line what the other did in three. Which do you like better? Well, do you want to remember three short things or one long thing? Your brain may work one way, your brain may work the other. Either way is totally cool. When we draw a flow chart, it's going to look a lot more like this unless we just have the word input A, right? But it's okay to simplify in a flow chart. It's like it was okay to simplify in a pseudocode, right? So these three lines means input A. This one line means input B. So how did it work that we were able to combine three things in one? Well, if we look, it's got all things, all three things in it. That print statement is kind of hidden here in the input. But don't put the word print here. Don't do float, parentheses, input, parentheses, print. Common mistake because you think, well, teacher said I was doing, you know, three things in one line. I better have my float and my input and print. Nah, it'd be kind of cool if it would do that, but it doesn't. You don't stick the word print in here. It's just that the input statement can accept a prompt telling it what to print. And so that lets us put this green text here, what is the value of A, inside the input function. And it'll print that out. Kind of a shortcut that lets us skip the print statement entirely. And then the response from input A, we stored in a variable and then pass that into a function called float. And then got that result out and stored it into A. <coughs> We're doing the same thing here, except we use the result of this, right? High level abstracted, we told it to get input. I don't care how the computer lets me type it in. It's beyond my pay grade. But then once it gets the result of that, it returns it so I can pass it into float, just like we did up here. And then that gets returned and stored into B. All right, now we only have a little bit left to do. But you see what I'm doing? I took the pseudocode and I'm turning it into programming code. I'm leaving the pseudocode in just as comments to describe what I'm doing. All right, how about this set C equals A times B? Well, you don't use the set word in this language. Lo and behold, it's that easy. And in the pseudocode, I wouldn't really mind leaving the word set off. And if you leave the word set off in that pseudocode and just make it look C equals A times B, any other programmer would know what you meant. I would have been able to write the C++ code even if I hadn't left that word set off. Similarly, if you want to say print C or display C rather than output C, that works just as well <coughs> in pseudocode. It may not be textbook perfect, but I know what you mean. Everybody who reads this is going to know what the word print means. And in fact, that's the word that I use in Python. Print, parentheses, quote. Now what are we going to just say? Are we going to say C equals blah blah? Or are we going to give a better description of it, like A times B or the value of C, right? There's several different ways we could describe it. How about A times B equals, end quote, comma, C. Now, I'm being kind of dumb here because I'm using uppercase letters in my input statements, but I'm storing them in the lowercase variables. The only time I'm using the uppercase letters is in the messages, the green text. Everywhere else I'm using lowercase. If that bugs you, you could either make all these A's uppercase or you could make this lowercase. But then it doesn't look so good to me. What is the value of a? Uh, what is the value of a what? Right? Anyways, normally we'll be asking for a radius or you know a weight or a temperature or a height or something like that, and we won't have to worry about that. But I just wanted to point that out. If you typed in uppercase A there, 
and you started using uppercase A up here, you better do that everywhere. It's not like English where you start off a sentence with an uppercase letter and then the rest of it's lowercase. If you call your variable lowercase here, it better be lowercase everywhere. It didn't matter what's in this green text. I mean, it matters to the user, right? But let's pretend, uh, you know, we were writing this, you know, in Klingon. And, you know, it said Kopla um, Vasta A, right? <laughs> it doesn't really matter what's in there. And I just made that up. I, I, I don't know. I don't speak Klingon. But, you know, this stuff is not going to break the language because it's just a message that gets displayed on the screen. All right, let's undo that little bit of silliness. I should actually learn that. Try it on press show. All right, what's the value of A? 10. What's the value of B? 20. A times B equals 200. Notice that the second time it ran, it put the question on the same line as the output here. What is the value of B? It let me type it on the same line. If you like it like that, then you'd want to do this second style of input, right, where you combined all of it into one line. On this one, it put the print statement below it. If you like that, you might lean towards doing it in this three-step process. It's entirely up to you. I'm never going to count you off because you chose to put the cursor underneath the question or at the end. All right. We all good or anybody need? Yeah. I'm getting used to it. All right. Okay. Is this something we should have in here right now? If this is just the first part of the Yeah, I put all that in the notepad. It actually wasn't in the oh, code okay. at all. I need to not so all we're going to, it's not that we don't need to have it in there. Uh, I'm not going to show this to everybody, but why not just make it one great big <coughs> comment by putting triple quotes there? Mm -hmm. And we'll go down to where our actual code is and uh, undo it with the triple quotes. And I'll show that to everybody. Okay. All right, gang, if you were typing along with my note card here, if you see me load up Notepad, this is not an actual programming window, and so I could type in anything here. But if you type that into your Python program, it's not going to run. If you do type those into your Python program and you wish that your program would actually run, you need to comment that stuff out. So let's say that I had actually typed it all in. I mean, oh, teacher's typing it in. I better type it in too. Well, that's great and all, but this is not good programming. It's pseudocode. It's just pure notes. I would need to block it off as a comment. It's a multi-line comment. I could just go and stick these all, you know, all through that, but I don't want to type that much. So I'm going to type the triple quotes there. You can also use triple apostrophes if you like. And then come down to the bottom of all that stuff and do a close to my triple quotes, right? And so all the green stuff is ignored. So is it working better now? All right, cool. All right, cool. All So what's the good stuff about modularization? Modularization can be a little bit of a pain, right? You have to think more about the program. Sometimes the act of modularizing it, you know, makes the program actually seem longer when you're starting out. Well, I didn't want to have to define a function and return a value and stuff like that. And I'll give you an example of that. This little line right here. Say I would wanted to define a function that did it. Well, it might look like this. I'm just going to put it up in the comments, though. No, I'm actually going to make it part of the program, but I'm not going to actually call it. But this is just going to be a, an example, pure example. And I'm not expecting you to do modules yet. But if I do this, def mult parentheses x comma y in parentheses quote result equals x times y return result okay and then down here when I was ready to do this set statement it could have looked like this C equals mult a times B right that would have worked just as well as the other 
But where I had one line of code, all of a sudden I have, you know, all of this stuff plus that. Makes it look more complicated. Well, why would you want to do modules? <coughs> well, in this particular case, if you're just replacing one line of code with a module, maybe that wasn't the best idea. On the other hand, if it's going to do something complicated, that's when you want to write modules. Right? What if this, this uh, formula had several steps? You had to calculate the radius, then you had to use that to calculate the surface area, and then you use that to calculate the, paint of, the cost of the paint that would paint the surface area. Right? Something like that. It might be three steps long. Putting it in a module lets multiple programmers work on it at the same time. You can just kind of define what the modules are supposed to do, and then I can say, okay, I need you to write the circle function, I need you to write the surface area function, and I need you to write the, you know, the paint function, whatever, right? We can break it up into individual pieces. I'm going to add a little comment here, is that we didn't actually use this function in the code, <coughs> unless you want to. If you want to do it like that, you can type that in, uncomment it, comment out the line underneath it, now we're actually be using it. But I just wanted this to be a straight example of a math calculation with input and output, matching our pseudocode. So rarely does a single programmer write a commercial program. Right, video <coughs> games are written by teams, you know, programmers. Even in what's known as an indie video game, is usually written by, by two or three people rather than just one. Because one person just can't simply crank out enough code to make a modern looking program. They're too complicated, they're too long. And if it's a great big program, you know, by a large company, Electronic Arts or whatever, you know that there's giant teams working on it. So, professional software developers write new programs by dividing large programs, large problems, into modules. So I could write, you know, my graphics routines. And you write the functions that accept the, you know, the data from the keyboard and the mouse and the touch screen and stuff like that. You assign each module to an individual programmer or a team. So let you break it down like that. Another reason to do it is you test each module separately. I don't have to write a whole program in order just to see it draw a circle. I could write that circle function and then just write barely enough code to test the circle function and I can go woohoo, it actually draws a circle. Awesome. I didn't have to write the whole program and wait until the end to see if it drew the circle. You can test each one. In this code I wrote here, I could print the result out temporarily, right? I could add a print statement that prints out x, y, and the result and then I could call the mult function a couple of different times, right? Even skipping the rest of the program, and I could just see it print out x, y, and the result. And I would go, yeah, cool. It's doing its multiplication correct. And then I might comment out that, you know, that debug statement that I added. So writing in modules lets you test the program's pieces. I can make sure that this function works, and then pretty much I can ignore it until there ever turns into be a problem, or if somebody ask for it to be changed. I don't know why you would change a multiplication function, right? It's pretty simple, it's supposed to multiply two numbers, but maybe the circle function could be written to do something better or draw faster or whatever, in which case you would go back and revisit it. Otherwise, once you've written it, it's a done deal. You probably don't need to touch it anymore. So reliability, once the function has been tested and proved to function correctly, you're good to go. And then reusable. If I really like that multiply function, I think it's the bee's knees, I could use it over and over in my other programs. I might even stick it in a separate file so that I could do import, you know, mult or whatever, and then I'd be able to use that function over and over. And again, just for something that multiplies two numbers, that's a little bit simple. But for something that's doing that complex calculation that took several steps to do, great. Or what if you write a really fancy input function that's a replacement for the word input that asks the user for a value, checks it to make sure it's a number, doesn't crash if they type in something else, you might want to use that one over and over. You could write that function once and then you could start copying and pasting it into all your homework that you turned on. Or you could store it in a separate program and then use an import to get it in. If you're going to do that, then please you know, upload both files, both the, uh, the file with your import function and the one that uses it. Allows the individual modules to be used in a variety of applications. I may need to multiply over and over. Okay, so huge example. 
programming graphical user interface programs like this, like Windows programs, used to be incredibly difficult. If I went and I found, let's see if I can do this within 30 seconds. Windows, hello world example. That's probably going to be too simple. Hello world in many languages. So what's hello world in many languages mean? It just shows you the little bit of text, the bare minimum of program in all these different languages. And you can see that there's 8 billion different languages necessary to write out the word hello world. Lots of times it's just like one line of code and a comment above it. Sometimes you can tell it's kind of a more primitive language or something that you know requires more lines in order to do it. Here we're getting kind of, you know, don't really want to do it like that. But let's go look. Getting there. Well, I'm not finding it. I didn't grab the correct hello world example. But just to write a program that would put a window on the screen, and the window had a little closed box, and it had a title bar to let you move it around, and a minimized box so that you could minimize it to the toolbar and stuff like that, could easily take hundreds of lines of code back in the old days. Nowadays, it's just a few lines of code, most likely, because Microsoft or whoever's providing you the libraries that you use gives you libraries that encapsulate all that stuff. So, if you're going to write a program that's going to display a menu on screen, you're just going to get to call some menu functions or call some menu library, and it's going to be able to do that, other than the hundreds of lines of code that it would take to draw all this, and the hundreds of lines of code that it would take to put this inside a window, and to respond to minimize events, to hide it, and to respond to maximize events, to bring it back, right, all that kind of stuff. Once the stuff has been modularized, then it can be reused over and over. And so a lot of programs will share a lot of common code. Like Word and Excel and PowerPoint, you notice how they all kind of look similar? That's because uh, Microsoft has their own library of functions that they've written that does all that stuff. So that a Microsoft programmer can write a graphical user interface program pretty quickly. Many real world examples of reusability. Well, I just gave you one. Uh, another example. These graphics libraries that uh, these video games use, right? You know, the first person shooters or whatever. Guys who came up with uh, Quake, one of the early games, took their code, took their modules, and started selling their modules to other video game developers so that they could also write their own games. And they made way more money doing that than they actually made from the game Quake. Way, way, way more money. Because they'd written their stuff in a modular way and it was so clear and easy to use. I'm sure it was very complicated to use still, right? But far less complicated than you having to sit down and write all the geometry and video game drivers and stuff like that. So those guys made a ton of money doing that. And so a lot of the video games that you buy are based on libraries of graphics routines that were written by somebody else. So to include a module, you have a module header, a module body, and a module return statement. In Python, it would be called a function header, a function body, and a function return statement. If we go back and look at our source code, we had that. Remember my mult function? That's the header. What does the header tell me? It tells me that it's a function because of that word, DEF. It tells me the name of the function, and it tells me the input that it requires. Two variables. Technical term for those are arguments. It requires two arguments, so it has these parameter variables to accept those arguments. And then it has a body. 
Well, in this case, a body is just like one or two lines long, whether you count the return statement as part of the body or not, and I would because it's indented underneath it. The entire body of the function has to be indented one level after the function header. And then the return statement. So those are the three parts that the textbook says that your functions will have. Not all functions need to return something. What if it was just supposed to display something on the screen? The circle function that comes with the turtle. It's not actually returning anything, right? It just drew a circle. Yay, it drew a circle. I don't need a value back from that in order to do something else. So that function probably doesn't have a return statement. <coughs> but you will always have a function header. You will always have a function body. And if the function is a so-called fruitful function, fruitful meaning bearing fruit, meaning that it returns something, you better have that return statement as well. Naming a module is the same as naming a variable. Same rules. Can't have a space in it. Letters, digits, and underscores are all okay. Can't begin with a digit though. Module names are followed by a set of parentheses, just like we saw here. That was my module name. That's how I defined its name. And when I called it, it also was followed by the parentheses down here. So when a main program wants to use a module, if somebody asks you where the main code in this is, in Python, it's kind of harder to spot the main code because you don't have to stick everything into a main function or a main method. In Python, it's just everything that's unindented. That's my main code here. The main code is separate from all the functions that you defined. In some languages, all of this would be put in inside its own function. I don't type this because I'm going to immediately undo it. But if this was one of those languages, it would look like that, right? All the main code went into its own function named main. Makes it really easy to spot what the main code is. Just remember that your main code is the code that's unindented. If you're going to do a flow chart, really bugs me that I haven't been able to find out how to make a lucid chart, except uh, our student accounts not be limited. I guess we could draw them and take screenshots, but then our flowchart would all have to fit in one screen. Anyways, a flowchart <coughs> looks like this. It's got a start box <coughs> up at the top, and then it's got some kind of code. If I was going to input A, then an input goes in a t what I call a tilted rectangle because that's more fun than saying quadrilateral or parallelogram. And so that would say input A. I used an uppercase letter there where I probably shouldn't. And then it would call the math code A equals B times C or whatever. I forgot to do the input C, so let's copy that and make another one that says input B. And then I could say set A or set C equals A times B, or I might just leave the word set off. <coughs> and then I would have an output statement underneath it. Output is done in the same tilted rectangle that an input's done in. So output C, and then a return circle at the bottom. And then what I should have been doing is drawing a line between each one of these. I don't know what I called this when I said, when I started drawing the oval. That's called a terminator, just like that is. That's the begin terminator, that's the end terminator. But anyways, I should have drawn a line hooking them all up. And I'm going to totally cheat and just draw that line once and then bring these others up to the front via wizardry. So I'm doing a range, bring the front. If you've ever used a drawing program, that lets you do things like, okay, there's my flow chart for our pseudocode. Input, output goes into tilted rectangles. Math, another straight procedural call goes in that. Now, if this was a module call, if it was calling our mult function, we would replace that with this symbol which the uh, flow charting program calls a predefined process. It's a function call, it's a module call. 
C equals malt A comma B. So if I had actually written my module, right, and I wanted to indicate that I was calling it, same shape, right, but it's got these bars. Now the textbook says to put the bars on the top and the bottom. Different flowchart programs have rectangles with bars on the top and the bottom or on the sides. This one happens to have them on the side. Same business. And then you'd have another function over here that, that actually did that. And I'm not going to even take the time to draw it. But this is calling a predefined process, is what the Lucid chart calls it. It's just a function call. And we have another column over here with our function indicating what it does. It'd only be like three lines of code long. We'd have a start oval, it had a calculation, and it would have a return oval at the bottom. Okay. If it's that short, why don't I draw it? So it had some math. If you remember that, it multiplied A times B or X times Y. So I would define it something like that. And then it would have a line of math that did the math. Excuse me, a line of code that did the math. It would have a block here. Result equals x times y. I'll zoom back in so that's easier to see. I could also try to increase the font size and stuff like that. And then it needs to return the result. And this is how I should have been doing it, right? Drawing the lines between everyone. OK, so this is our mult function. Looks the same, except it doesn't have a start. It has a DEF word to mean that it's a function. Notice that here we called it A and B, and here we called it X and Y. Is that going to break it? Should that be A and B? No, because these variables are different than these variables. These values get copied into that. Just like if I take myself to a hospital, my name may be Jeff Thompson, but the hospital may record me as patient 123785, right? So Jeff goes in a hospital, but I have a different name when I'm there. I'm known by my patient number. Sounds kind of grim, but anyways. So these values don't have to match that. No, uh, these variable names don't have to match the names of the parameter variables. It's just that they get copied in. If A is 10 and B is 20, then when we get here, X is 10 and Y is 20. It calculates the result and it returns it. So when we call C is equal to mult AB, Dun, 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 dun. It does that, it does that, it does, does that, and returns back to there. And if I cared, I could draw some kind of dashed line that did that. I'm not seeing how to do it real fast, so I'm not going to do that right. And you wouldn't do that in anything you turned in. Okay, so we've shown how to do a flow chart for a module. What if we wanted to do it in pseudocode? It'd look pretty similar. I'm sure we'll see a slide of it in pseudocode coming up soon. Here, when I was calling them terminators, they're calling them sentinel symbols. Tisk tisk book. The ovals are the sentinel symbols. And here's their example of a flow chart. You're not going to let me zoom in? Fine. Now, this one is not modularized. They do have their declarations, and I've talked about how in Python, you don't strictly have to have a declarations block. And then they do some input, and then they do some output, they do some more output, and they do some more output, and they do get more output. Okay? So here's how they would have pseudocoded it. They have a declarations block, and the declarations are kind of tabbed over. I'm not going to do declaration boxes in my pseudocodes since they're not necessary in Python. Then they have input, output, 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 output. They don't show the modularization of it. There it is. I think so.
Oh, come on. All the function keys that are supposed to zoom in on a program, like Control Plus and stuff like that, aren't really working for me. All right, so it's been modularized. This has got the bar along the top. It's the same thing as if it's got the bars on the side. But it's still got its declaration section, and it's got an input statement that asks for the name and the balance. Apparently, they feel totally good about sticking two different input statements in the same block rather than breaking it up like I did. Okay, fine, if I follow their example, no problem. Saves a block on our flowchart. And then here's a function. Here's a module. When they flowcharted it, they didn't stick the word DEF in front of the name. <coughs> I like putting the DEF there <coughs> just because that's how we do it in Python, right? Just to remind you. And so what does our display address info module do? It outputs one thing, it outputs the second thing, it outputs the third thing, and then it returns. And so when it hits this function call, it runs over here, it does all that module, it comes back, and then it outputs yet a couple more things. Honestly, I'm not sure why it didn't output these two things over here as well, right? Because the rest of these are output statements. Anyway, so they broke the program up into something that a printout name of the company, the address of the company, the more of the address of the company, and then come back and print some customer name and customer total. Oh, I get it. This address information over here is our company's address, not the customer's address. That's bizarre. It's supposed to be like a receipt, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's like a receipt, exactly. Declaring your variables and constants within modules. Those are called local variables. In my code over here, I said that I had, some, you know, my main code was unindented. I have plenty of variables declared here, right? If I was following the textbook, I would have declared them before I used them. Do I feel like doing that? Sure, why not for this example? Normally, I don't do that because Python invents, creates the variables the first time it sees them if they don't already exist. I even have a variable down here called C. So I could declare that one as well. Declaring them is just like introducing them to the program, right? I'm going to be using these variables later, so I'm going to introduce them to you right now. Not necessary in Python. These are all local variables. They're local to main. What do I mean by that? It means that in here, I can't just suddenly print out the value of A. If I add a print, parentheses A here, don't add that because it breaks the code. Why? Because A is not available to this function. Right? It was declared down here. Not going to work at all. And if it did work, it's just because <coughs> through a fluke. Not going to work at all. That's why we had to pass in A as a parameter variable down here. Otherwise, this function, this module, doesn't have any clue as to what was declared inside the main code. These modules have their own local variables, local meaning owned entirely by that module. Result is defined here. That variable is only available inside here. I could not put print result down here. You know, I can't do that. Again, I need to delete that. I've added several things I, I better delete. Please don't be typing them or else you better delete them. Okay, I can't print the result because that variable is local to here. It disappears as soon as that return statement, right? It's just like this is a couch inside my home. It's local inside my house, right? My train system is local to my city. If you're living in Austin, you can't hop on my train, you know, to go to Bricktown. Doesn't work, it's local to my city. This variable is local to this function to this module, just like these variables are local to the main code. Now there is such a thing as a global variable. A global variable is one that's defined above all of the functions. I could go and declare a global variable here and then we could read it inside the function and we could read it down here in main. <coughs> okay, I promised I was going to delete the things that was going to cause syntax errors. I better do that. So that print A was a mistake. That print result was a mistake because I was trying to print variables that were local to something else.
So variables that are declared in a module or are usable only within that module. They're also called in scope. That sounds a little bit weird. But this variable is in scope inside that function, but it's out of scope outside. And I guess that kind of makes sense, right? It's beyond the scope of the program, right? We kind of use our English like that. I think I like the term local variable better. But that variable's scope is from where it's defined until the return statement. That's the scope of its lifetime. Out here, that variable can't be used, which is why we have to return its value before we can use it. <coughs> so the scope of the variable is where it can be accessed. Local variables can only be used in the function in which they are declared. Like A, B, and C in our main code, and like result in the mult function. So these are local variables, local variables, like that local train system that's local to Oklahoma City. A global variable is one that's defined above everything else. Above all the modules, above all the functions. We don't really have an example of a global variable here. It's all right. come back and capitalize the word scope there, kind of making our vocabulary words. So a local variable is defined in the body of a function or in the main code. So a module is a self-contained unit that's easily transported. I could cut this mult function out, paste it into another program, and it would work just as well. It's not relying upon anything else. All it needs are these two parameter variables. So all it needs to be used is to be called like that. Right, so when a programmer sits down to use my mult function, they just need to decide what they're going to pass in as the two arguments, A and B, that fill in the two parameter variables. I have a question. Uh-huh. On the mult function. So when they, before they call it, they have to find that A and B at the end of the Right, right. What this does is it's like these are variables, just like that one is, except they're defined in the header. And why are they defined in the header? So that when we actually call the function, we can pass in pieces of data to give those variables values. Here's another dumb example. You have a truck with a pick a pickup with a bed. This is the bed, right, that contains the stuff that you load into the truck. These are the things that you load into the truck. I should write down and publish all these examples so other pub, um, programmers would laugh at me. The most common configuration for mainline logic. The top of the programs usually for declarations for global variables and constants. And then maybe your program has some housekeeping tasks, like maybe it needs to open a window or open a file or something like that. Steps you must perform at the beginning of the program to get ready for the rest. And then you have detail loop tasks, which are the work of the program, and then you have end of job tasks. Now our program didn't really have any housekeeping tasks. But if we go and look at it, we could pretend that defining a function is a housekeeping task, but it's not really. Declaring our variables, that's not really a housekeeping task, but what if we needed to read our data from a file or print some kind of introductory message for the users, like welcome to the row state multiplier, right? That could be a housekeeping task. And then what they call the main loop. Well, we're not looping in here, but most programs loop. Why? Because it, you usually don't run a program to just do one itty bitty little thing and have it exit, right? 
like these Windows programs, you run them and they sit there waiting for you to type stuff and they keep running until you click the close box. So something inside them is looping, waiting for your user input. Just like your calculator, you pop open your little calculator, you can keep using it until you click the close box. Our multiplier program, we might want to keep asking for numbers to multiply until they close the window. So that's called a loop, right? They're calling that the detail loop. And then the end of job tasks are the stuff that the program has to do in order to finish up. Like if it opened a file to write data to it, it needs to close the file, otherwise that file might be lost. Everybody's used a word <coughs> processing program and you close the program and it warns you, right? Do you want to save your data? That'd be an end of job task, reminding them to save their data. So here's what they're showing. A start, some declarations, some housekeeping, the housekeeping, I guess, is opening a file or something, and then it keeps looping while it reads the file, calling some detail loop function, and then at the end of it, it does some end of job, which might close the function. So a hierarchy chart shows the overall picture of how modules are related to one another. We might have a main program that has a housekeeping section, a detail loop, and an end of job. And then what if the housekeeping opens, uses a function, right? So our main program calls housekeeping, which calls get order. This is not a flow chart, right? It's not showing order. There's no arrows. And then our main program calls a data loop, which calls a process order, which calls check inventory, check credit, whatever, whatever. It also calls get order, and then end of job calls display summary, or whatever that says. Right, okay, so this is a hierarchy chart. It's showing which modules call which modules. Our program would just have main program and then un underneath it molt, right? Because we only had one function to find one module. It'd be the world's simplest hierarchy chart. I guess simpler would be if we didn't have any functions at all and it just said main program. <coughs> I'm not going to ask you to draw a hierarchy chart. Maybe there's a quiz question over it. Maybe not. The same function might be called by multiple things, right? Maybe I uh, have a fancy super duper print statement. And so get order might call my print function, so I might put it over here. But also display summary might also call it, so I have that box over here again. And it would look weird because that's actually the same module, even though it's displayed on separate places. Features a good program design. Use comments to explain your program. Use identifiers that are carefully chosen. I don't know if I've said this before. I use single letter variables because they're easy for y'all to type in class and they save me from wandering around, you know, checking for missed typos and, you know, uppercase, lowercase confusion and stuff like that. But I should be more careful. If I'm a professional programmer, I'm not going to be using single letter variable names for anything except the simplest of data, like a counter. Strive to design clear statements within your programs and modules. If your code is not understandable to you at an instant, then it's not going to be understandable at all to anybody else who comes and looks at it. Write clear prompts and echo input. Well, I didn't, I did the uh, write clear prompts. I didn't really do a great job because I didn't explain why they were entering values of A and B, right? So I probably should have had a line up above that said, this program multiplies two numbers. Right. That would have been a good thing to do. I was following the pseudocode exactly, so I didn't. But that would be more clear. And then when they say echo the input, at the bottom where it said A times B, I could have printed out two more lines. A equals, B equals, and then A times B equals, right? That way, if the user got a wrong result, Right? If they see this message A times B equals 10,000, they wonder why the heck it came out 10,000. Well, they could scroll up the program and see what they typed in, but if I echoed the input here with a couple more print statements, it'd be real obvious. Oh, I added an extra zero when I was typing my number in. Just like when you're placing an Amazon order, it's, they give you that final screen with the summary of everything, the shipping method, the orders, the payment method, and then you can go ahead and do it. That's echoing all the inputs so that the user feels comfortable before they place that order. 
and continue to maintain good programming habits as you develop your programming skills. Good idea, right? You're not going to just write comments in this class and then when you graduate and go to another class, you're not going to stop writing comments. Nah. Program comments are written ex explanations of programming statements. They're not part of the program logic. And those things with the hashtags, I could put anything I want in there, right? It's just for me. It serves as internal documentation for the program. It explains what the program's doing. Our programs are so simple at first that you're not going to really feel the need to add the comments yourself. But go ahead and do so, right? Impress me with your clear comments. The syntax for a comment dif differs among programming languages. In some languages, you don't use that hashtag. Instead, you use that. Or in some languages, you box off the comments like that. Don't be doing this because it doesn't work in Python. When you look at the book, you'll see examples of those because they show stuff other than Python as well. And you can use an annotation symbol to hold information that's kind of a comment for a flow chart. It's just like putting a box on your flow chart that explains something about it. Here's an example. I was going to declare a number in this pseudocode, number of square feet, and then I'm going to add a comment explaining what square feet is. Square feet is an estimate provided by the seller of the property. Num price foot. Here's my comment. Price foot is determined by current market conditions. And then number lot premium. Lot premium depends on the amenities, such as whether the lot is waterfront. See, these comments give me a lot of information about it. Right? If it just said num square feet, num price per foot, and lot, num lot premium, yeah, I can maybe figure out what it's doing. But the comments are giving me a lot more information. I understand what the program is trying to do. And if this just said num f and num p and num l, right, single letter variable names, I would not have a single clue. Choosing identifiers. Your variable names or your function names. Give them variable names a name that is a noun because they're holding data. Height, <laughs> right? Height is a noun. Price, temperature. Give a module an identifier that is a verb. Mult, meaning multiply, right? The functions do stuff. Now, not everybody. The dot circle function doesn't really sound like a verb, right? If it needed to be a verb, we could have called it draw circle. So these are guidelines. Use meaningful names. Dot circle makes it self-documenting. I can tell that it's going to be drawing a circle. Dot left tells it, telling it to go left. Well, then again, it's self-documenting. I don't even need to add a comment. If it said, you know, Leo dot left, parentheses 90, I don't need to add a comment over here saying turn the turtle left 90 degrees. It's already readable enough. It's a good idea to use pronounceable names. Here where we had price per foot, you don't need to go nuts, right? It's a legal variable name, but if I'm looking at it per, per foot, no. I wouldn't know what per, per foot was until you know I saw a comment to that. We're not limited in our variable names. You may as well give them good variable names, right? Be judicious in their use of abbreviations. Only use them where it kind of makes sense. And avoid digits in a name. There's really no reason to call a variable x1, x2, and x3, even though we can, and even though I might do that in a very simple math example. Use the system your language allows to separate the words into long multi-word variable names. Well, nah. our language does not allow us to separate the words. The closest we can get is to use underscores. If I want a long variable name, like patient height in inches, I can't do this, patient height in inches. I could do patient height inches, right? That was pretty good. Or I could use underscores, patient height inches, something like that. These are legal variable names. Multiple words to give extra clarity to what the variable means. Now, if I was typing the program in here, for y'all to follow along, I'd probably just call it height. It's not really the best variable name, but it's easy for y'all to type. 
I might even do age, right? It's even easier for y'all to type. Easy to type shouldn't count so much when you're writing your own program. Easy to type counts a lot when I'm teaching 25 students and I don't want people to make, making, you know, transposing their E's and their I's and leaving off the H and the G. So programmers can create a list of all the variables, a data dictionary. Up here in my declarations, I could explain what A and B are, right? I could up here and I could add some comments as to what A is. And I could add some comment as to what B is and what C is. I could copy and paste that into an extra piece of paper, call it my data dictionary. A is an integer that contains the value to multiply. B is an integer that contains the second value to multiply. Right, that's a data dictionary. And we're not going to do data dictionaries, just tuck it away. What is a data dictionary? It's a list of the variables, what kind of data they hold, how they get filled in. Designing clear statements. Avoid confusing line breaks. Mm, okay. Use temporary variables to clarify long statements. What does that mean? Now, don't type this. This isn't going to work at all. But what if my formula was, you know, B times X plus C, you know, 2 comma Y plus, you know, D over, you know, the sine of, you know, whatever, you know. Whatever. Pretend that this just went on and on and on. I might want to break it up into several statements, right? So above that, I might want to put it, you know, ratio equals that. And then I could put ratio there, right? Simplify it. And what is that? I don't know what that is. That's the cost. I totally made this up, right? So there we go, right? It's starting to make a lot more sense, except it doesn't, right? Because I made it up off the top of my head. But anyways, you can see what I mean. These are known as temporary variables. The only reason I calculated cost is so I could use it later on. But that was just to save myself from writing this line of code that was, you know, 80 or line, uh, 90 characters long. You know, by the time the code is scrolling off your professor's screen, he's starting to wish that he had used some temporary variables. You're trying to make your lines short and easy to read and easy to understand. Now something about unnecessary line breaks, I don't know why they threw that in there. Line breaks are good because they break your code up into sections, right? Here's the inputting of A. Here's the input of B. I could have added a comment here that said calculate C, right? But I guess what they mean is don't add a line break there. I don't know. Some people hate line breaks. I had one student who just absolutely would not put line breaks into their code, you know, and they explained why. They just didn't like it, and I, I gave them credit for it, you know. But kind of makes just like a book with a space between the paragraphs and tabs, you know, the first line of the paragraph and, you know, double, whatever. It's called white space, and it can make your program easier to follow. Most modern language are free form. Well, Python's really not. It's kind of, you can add as many carriage returns as you want, but it's very particular about the tabs. We're going to be about done for the day. Doesn't look like I'm going to be giving you homework on this particular one. Make sure your meaning is clear. Do not combine multiple statements on one line. What does that mean? Well, didn't you combine multiple statements on that print? print? Well, yeah, sort of. But I could have written it like this. Here that is. I'm going to copy and paste and then uh, delete, so please don't type this because it's doing example what they told me not to do. There. I'm not sure that would run in this language. It would run in a lot of languages. I use semicolons to break it up. I don't know if that'll work or not. But even if it did, that's kind of lame. You might say, what's the difference between that and that? Well, this is using the input from one function to feed another. So it's not really three separate statements. It's one statement that does all of that stuff. This is three separate statements. You wouldn't want to chain them like that. <clears throat> Why don't we wrap it up here? How close are we to the end of the chapter? Real close. All right.
I mentioned temporary variables. A prompt is when you display a message on the screen. Echoing input I've talked about is when you display again what the user typed in, just kind of as a clarification when you display your answers. Your programs will be better if you plan before you code. If you draw your flowcharts or pseudocode first, and at first I will be asking you to do pseudocode and flowcharts after a certain point, I'm, I'm going to stop asking for those. Think carefully about the variables and module names, you know, just call them X and Y, and design your statements to be easy to read. <clears throat> That's enough.